But um, I'm glad that this is uh, the third of our sessions. And um, we have David Quammen, the one of my favorite authors, although admittedly I'm a bit, um, a bit biased here. But many of you know him from his work, if you've been around long enough, from Outside Magazine, as well as National Geographic. And then his great books, among them Song of the Dodo, Spillover, which has become particularly prescient these days, and then his most recent book, uh, The Tangled Tree, which is absolutely incredible for any of us interested in evolution. And this group has a particular bent toward evolution. Uh, represented uh, strongly in this group are members of the NCSE teacher ambassador community, as well as TIES, the Teacher, teacher Institute Great. for Evolutionary Studies group and a collection of some other folks I've invited who are amongst, in my opinion, this group, the best biology teachers in the country today. Um, so we're just thrilled that in these weird times you could make time to, to share with us, David. I'm so delighted to be. Hand it over to you now. Uh, you, oh, you're gonna hand it over to me? Uh-oh. Well, anyway, I'm delighted to be with you all. Uh, and I can see some of the backdrops. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, before I start to talk about uh, um, tangled trees or emerging viruses or, um, or anything, um, I'm curious about where you all are uh, in, in physical space as well as here together with us in virtual space. Um, why, don't, why don't you just kind of maybe quickly take turns letting me know, I can see your names, which is great. Um, where the heck are you? California and at home. They're all working from different rooms and I teach high school. Um, who I was that? Where? Padmini Kishore. Oh, ah, Padmini, okay. Uh, how come, John, how come uh, her uh, rectangle didn't light with a green margin? Do you know? Padmini, when your microphone is obviously on, but usually, now, now, John, now you've got the conch shell. You're lit with a, in, at least on my screen, with a green chartreuse. Yes, there. I had, you, I, I had you spotlighted, and that may be why it, it didn't show. Oh, okay. But well, now, it's I've turned off spotlighting. Okay. Uh, Ped Mini, say something again. Um, I heat at California. Am I glowing now with green? <laughs> It's, it is. Water. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Who else? Jump in, anybody. I'll jump in. Hi. Greetings. My name's Colleen Swihart. I teach out in the Portland, Oregon area. Okay. Great. And your rectangle was green also. Yay. It, I just wanted to say it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. Years ago, Song of the Dodo, I was the only person, I think, on a beach in uh, Daytona, Daytona Beach, Florida, reading your book. Couldn't put it down. <laughs> That's great to hear. I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm glad to know that there was even one person on a beach in Daytona reading the book. <laughs> Hi, David. I'm Kathy Van Hook. Um, I taught in the Chicago suburbs for many, many years, but retired and now I'm living in Iowa. And I just finished listening to The Tangled Tree and I have spillover in my audio audible queue. Great, thank you, Kathy. I'm Matt Brown, and if you can't tell from the accent, I'm from Texas. Where, what part of Texas, which is what, the what part largest Texas? in the world? It's, your, your, um, your audio is a little harder to hear. I don't know why. Because uh, my microphone may not be that great. There, there we go. Yeah, that, that's what it takes right there. We can see your Yankees hat, and we can hear your voice. <laughs> It's a Texas accent with a Yankee hat. That seems yeah, very really? odd. Yeah, that is odd. Yeah. Well, I live in the city of Paris, so we're we're you know a little bit the second largest Paris in the world, second largest Apple Tower as well. Has a red Paris, cowboy hat on top. Paris, Texas, with a Yankee hat. That's great. I love it. Okay, thanks, Jack. I'm Katherine. Hey. I'm in Northern Virginia right now, um, but I'll be teaching high school this year in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Great, great. Yeah. Andy. 
All right, I am Andy Epton. I am um, in Virginia right now, but I'm going to be moving to Michigan at the end of this month. Um, and I'm actually not a bio teacher. I'm an earth science teacher, but I love paleontology. So um, that, that kind of gets me in the door here. <laughs> Good enough. Yeah. We let him play sometimes. <laughs> Lynn, where are you? I'm Brianna Ransom. I'm from Georgia. And uh, my background is the Grand Canyon because I actually helped teach a summer course in Earth Studies. And we went to the Grand Canyon as a part of that course. So I like the, the Earth Science part and the biology part of this. Great. Are you outside right now or you have a great picture window? I just have a great picture. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I'm Lynn Andrews and I... Um, and the director of teacher support for um, the majority of the NCSers here. Um, I work with all of the TAs to uh, bring science in evolution and climate change to the classroom. Was a classroom teacher for 18 years. And Kansas. In Kansas, okay. Thank you, Lynn. I'll go. My name's Sarah Ruggiero. I'm in Eugene, Oregon. I teach. Uh, Environmental science, AP environmental science. Um, I coordinate outdoor school for all of our elementary schools in the district. And um, I also teach in a CTE program, which is um, for natural resource management, so forestry, climate, ecology, et cetera. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for being here and doing this. You're very welcome. <laughs> I'll go. Um, I'm Rebecca Brewer. I'm coming from Michigan and I teach uh, high school biology. What part of Michigan? Um, Troy, Michigan. Okay, great. Thanks, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Hi, David. Jeremy Cook. I'm from uh, Indianapolis, and oh, I, I teach biology and zoology, and I, I loved the tangled tree. Hey, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much. It's a different kettle of fish from Spillover, uh, or the Song of the Dodo, and maybe I can talk about that a little bit when, when I get going. Who else? Alan? Hi, Hi David. Alan Wasmone, and I, uh, I live and am resting at home in Omaha. So I'm in the middle of the country, and uh, I teach uh, at Metropolitan Community College here in town. I've taught high school for a long time. I'm affiliated with the Ties organization. So Okay. All right. Well, good to, good to have you with us, Alan. Omaha. Omaha, also home of the, um, the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Absolutely. So we've had a lot of connection to COVID-19. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just did a piece for the New Yorker uh, about a guy at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, a fellow named Ali Khan, formerly of the CDC, and now he's dean of the School of Public Health there. Yeah, we actually have a collaboration we do with UNMC where we have a couple of their postdocs come over and teach for us to learn how to teach, and then we send a couple of our undergraduate students over there to get a lab experience with some of their dogs. Oh, oh great, great. Is that a real cat looking down from the ceiling? Uh, no, oh. it's just it's just fun. Okay, yeah, it is fun. Who else we got? Blake? Uh, hey, I'm, I'm Blake Touche. Uh, I teach in South Louisiana biology uh, and dual enrollment biology. Okay, South Louisiana. Makes my mouth water just to hear the words. <laughs> Um, hi, David and everybody. Um, my name's Erica, and I'm uh, sitting in my kayak at Finger Lake State Park in Columbia, Missouri. Um, no, it's just my background. I'm well, excited to be here. Well, good. We're glad to have you, Erica. You both fooled me, you and Brianna, with those backgrounds. And all I've got is, uh, is books and Boots the Python over in his tank right there. But he's... He's chilling right now. Sometimes he crawls around on my desk and climbs the bookshelf, but right now he's asleep. Um, did we get everybody? Um, I popped oh. in a little late. Hi, Luke. Um, well, I'm actually Ashley, but oh, okay. we just transferred over from my son's guitar lesson, so it was okay. still something under him. All right, you look a little bit more, I didn't want to be, you know, right, um, yeah. genderistic, but you looked a little bit more like an Ashley than a Luke. Um, so I teach at Perkins High School in Sandusky, Ohio. Um, I teach um, honors biology, um, anatomy and physiology, forensics, and then I teach um, biology and anatomy through the University of Finley at my high school. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Okay. Uh, and Molly, we didn't hear from you yet. Um, hi, my name is Molly Selba. I'm a PhD student at the University of Florida. Um, so I'm not actually a K-12 educator, but I work very closely with K-12 educators. Um, I'm part of the Scientist in Every Florida School initiative. So I've been um, visiting a lot of K-12 classrooms to do, um, to bring STEM lessons um, and partner with their teachers. And I also hosted a, um, a teacher workshop focusing on incorporating human evolution into science curricula last summer here at the University of Florida. So um, I myself am not a K-12 educator, but I'm happy that I get to participate. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, I think now we've, we've gotten a little bit from everybody. Um, so John, shall I talk for 10 or 12 minutes and then we'll see if people have questions and we can do a conversation? Yeah, I think that sounds like a, uh, a great move there. Let, let's go with that. And then okay. um, I think there's lots of questions out there. So okay. I'm going to spotlight well, um, you again for recording purposes. And then uh, uh, you're set to go. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, well, th there are, I guess, 100 different places that I might begin, um, but including uh, with COVID-19, but I won't. That's too obvious. We'll get to that. Uh, but I'll start elsewhere. Uh, and I'll, given who you all are, I'll start with uh, the fact, I'll start with a little bit of autobiography in my own journey, because, uh, not because it's inherently interesting, but um, because my life has um, turned out the way it has, me now being a, a science journalist and an author of science books, all about biological sciences evolutionary biology, ecology, conservation, etc. Uh, it has turned out this way despite the fact that I never had one of you. I never had a great biology teacher. Never did. Um, I had great English teachers. I was, the, I was the 10 and 11 year old kid who was always interested in two things. In the natural world, you know, snake in the room, um, uh, living in the woods behind the house all day after school and on the weekends, uh, uh, you know, knee deep in the creek and walking through the woods. Um, and I was always also interested in writing, writing poems, writing little plays, writing stories, etc. So literally from the age of 11 or so, I had those two interests. And then my life uh, for was shaped to a great degree by the fact that I had three great English teachers and never a great biology teacher. So I became a writer as opposed to becoming a biologist. Um, the first great English teacher was a Jesuit seminarian when I was a freshman in high school. The second great English teacher was a Jesuit priest who taught my class advanced placement English when I was a senior in high school, who said to me uh, early in my senior year, well, David, where are you applying to college? And I said, well, Father, uh, I was a very straight Catholic kid in those days. Um, so and I said, uh, Georgetown, Holy Cross, and Boston College, Father. And he said, well, those are great schools, Jesuit schools, by no coincidence, but have you thought about Yale? And I said, Yale, Yale. Yeah. What's Yale? Uh, it's, that's a, that's a non-Catholic school, isn't it, Father? Yes, it is, but they have a great English department. Maybe the country's best English department. What's so great about their English department? Well, they have Penn Warren, for starters. Who's Penn Warren? Well, Robert Penn Warren, he wrote the textbook that we're using, and he wrote Pulitzer Prize winning novels such as All the King's Men, et cetera, et cetera. And he told me about this great American writer and teacher, Robert Penn Warren. Uh, so I went to Yale, and three years later, my third grade teacher was Robert Penn Warren, um, who became my mentor and my friend and helped me get my first book published um, and um, did a lot of other things for me, recommendations and things. Um, and so I came out of graduate school, having done a graduate degree on William Faulkner and having published one novel when I was a just finished my senior year in college. And I thought, great, now I get to be a, a writer. Now I get to be a novelist. I'll move to Montana. I moved to Montana and then discovered 
how hard it is to be a fiction writer, how hard it is to make a living, even if you've broken the ice early, even if you've published one novel. Still very hard. So I paid my dues between my first book and my second book in Montana, here in Montana, working as a bartender and a waiter and a fishing guide and doing those things that, that starving young people do when they want to be writers. And, um, and, and writing, 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 writing more novels, which were not any good. My first novel had been, had been okay because I had a real story and real characters, partly from personal experience. My second and third and fourth tries were not so successful. And then I started reading biology and the history of biology. I'd had very, in college, I'd had almost no biology, um, despite my interest in the natural world. So uh, I started reading biology. I started taking courses, non-degree graduate courses in zoology at the University of Montana. And uh, I started discovering nonfiction discovering how artful nonfiction can be in the hands of someone like Lauren Isley uh, or um, you know, to some extent Robert Ardrey, John McPhee, um, Steve, early Stephen Jay Gould, um, J.B.S. Haldane, and, and others. And it was a revelation to me that nonfiction writing about the natural world and about hard science, biological science, could be really readable, really not just readable, not just clear, not just explanations, but it could be artful storytelling with, with revelations and themes and explanations built in to um, an artful nonfiction narrative. So I said, hey, I think that's what I want to do. And then, um, and then in 30 years, I became an overnight success. Um, I, I don't think I've skipped anything important. Uh, somewhere along there, I started doing the column for Outside Magazine that John mentioned. And that allowed me, um, uh, paid me just enough um, to get a foothold in freelancing and to stop the fishing guiding and, stopped the technical writing and the ghost writing and the other things. And then, so I did that for 15 years, wrote science columns for Outside Magazine. They gave me a lot of freedom. Um, I used to joke with the ed editor and there that um, I was their natural science columnist and my assignment was to write an essay about any cockamamie thing uh, that occurred to me as interesting each month, as long as it contained either an animal, a scientist, or a tree, and I could do whatever the hell I wanted. And so I did, and had great latitude to write essays that I never, ever could have sold on a freelance basis one at a time. So that was a great, um, uh, great privilege for me to, to have a continuous audience that I interacted with every month um, for 15 years. And then I and then I was done with that. I just couldn't do it anymore because I was, didn't want to repeat myself and it was getting harder rather than easier to write a fresh column each month. And at the same time, I had started writing, uh, or I had finished writing The Song of the Dodo, which took me eight years. And by the time I finished that, it was time to turn a page. So I published The Song of the Dodo. I quit the column and I started writing magazine features for other magazines. Anyway, including National Geographic and then also books such as Spillover and my little biography of Darwin, The Reluctant Mr. Darwin, and um, a book about big predators called uh, Monster of God, and then The Tangled Tree. So that's uh, the story of my life in uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Sorry to inflict that on you, but um, for some reason it seemed to me that that was the right starting point to tell you that Although I didn't have a great biology teacher, either in high school or in college, I know that great teachers change your life. So great teachers changed my life, turned me into a writer, and then I had to, circle, I had to go on a long circuit to get back to what I was really meant to do, which was being a writer who writes about biology.
Shall I pause there, John? That sounds okay. great. I think I think we're probably in a good spot to open things up because right now I'm seeing about 15 different uh, ways we could go with this. Okay. Uh, because well, I would be delighted now to, to stop talking about myself and start talking about biology. So if anybody has a question or a comment or a, a route that you would like to pursue what we could discuss, um, please speak up and, and help us shape this conversation. Well, I was curious, um, since you say you haven't had a great biology teacher, what quality do you think was missing from your biology classes that, that was making those teachers not qualify as great in your mm. mind? That's a good question, Brianna. Uh, when I was in high school, I, had, um, I took biology from the assistant football coach who was a, a, a terrific man. He was, he was a great big burly guy named Chuck King. Uh, I liked him very much. Um, he was not just an assistant football coach. He was a, he, he was a serious birder. He knew biology, but um, there was no spark that was set in my brain. I don't ever recall mention of the word evolution or the name Charles Darwin in that biology course. Was that because I was at a Jesuit school? I don't know. I don't think so. Because the Jesuits are pretty wildly open-minded. Um, uh, although they are sort of the, the special forces of the Catholic Church, or at least they were back in those days. Um, in college, uh, I took one biology course, freshman at Yale. I took Bio 110 um, from a fellow named Arthur Goldsby, I think, who is still around and apparently a brilliant man. But um, in that course, again, I don't remember the word evolution being mentioned. I remember we started with cell biology. I remember um, he walked us through the phyla of algae, green algae, blue-green algae, brown algae, purple algae, scientific names the this this are, the, are those are those phyla do i have that right or are there something are they lesser than that what are the what are the divisions of algae come on you biology teachers help me out well see if nobody has that answer on the tip of your tongue then i have just explained why i did not like this course because i went into the i went into the midterm i went into the midterm and, and he had talked about, you know, brown algae uh, doesn't photosynthesize, but does this and this. Blue-green algae differs from green algae in the following five ways. Okay, I listened to all that. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Uh, when do we get to the good stuff? Went into the midterm. Questions number one through eight. Blue-green algae has which characteristics? And my reaction was, you wanted us to memorize that stuff? What's the point of memorizing that stuff? Where's the idea content here? So that was my, that was my second and last biology course ever. The march through the kingdoms is rarely um, emphasized anymore in schools. I'm sure. I mean, I sat in on Jonathan Eisen's um, um, intro biology course at UC Irvine. Do you guys know Jonathan Eisen? You know who he is? Yes, no? He is, um, he is a biologist um, who has a, a blog. He's very active on his blog. I think his blog might even be called The Tree of Life, um, his website. Um, and that's why I spotted him when I was beginning work on the Tangle Tree. This guy has a website called The Tree of Life. He's talking about evolutionary phylogenetics. Great, I'm interested in that. I'm going to write a book about this stuff. I asked him if I can come down there and audit his course for the first week of his course. Yeah, his intro biology course. Intro at UC um, Irvine is the tree of life, is phylogenetics. He starts with that drawing right behind John and, and proceeds from there. So he teaches intro biology by teaching 
evolutionary phylogenetics from from Darwin to Carl Woese and beyond. And so I sat in his course, much, much more um, conceptual content than, than memorizing the kingdoms of, of algae. And not that I have anything against algae. Um, but, so that's, anyway, that's the answer, Brianna, I think. I had a question. Yes. Um, you refer to yourself as, I was a true Catholic then. So what changed when you started writing about evolution? Um, I'm not sure it would happen when, well, reading a lot of Darwin, reading a lot of history of um, science and history of thought, reading Peter Gay's wonderful two-volume history of the Enlightenment, and then starting to read some Enlightenment authors. Um, uh, you know, I was a devout Catholic probably through most of college. And then when I got out of college, I started reading more widely. And it just, with, with no, um, no resentment toward the Catholic Church, it just melted away entirely. So piggyback on that question, how do you, how would I, as a biology teacher, present to my freshmen in high school not hurting their true Catholic sentiment? I, I, my, my school is nestled next to Biola University, so I have a lot of pushback against evolution. Yeah, At, because of Loyola. Loyola is Jesuit also, right? Biola, this is Bi oh, oh, Biola. Biola. Yeah. yeah. That's um, interesting because Catholics accept evolution. Generally, yeah. yes. Yeah. But yeah. I, I was sent videos saying, have you ever tried looking at my theory? And no evolution is taught in that university. They're still on a phylogenetic tree and other things. So that's what I was told. Yeah. How do you, how do you make sense of the phylogenetic tree without evolution? Oh, yeah. I'm not going to contest that, but... <laughs> Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's a difficult problem. And, and um, how do you teach evolution to kids who have grown up being told that you shouldn't believe in evolution? Um, delicately. Okay. Respectfully. Right. Um, I mean, you don't... How old are the kids that you're teaching? 14, 15. 14, 15, delicate, difficult age. Um, you want to, you, I know, I mean, I'm going to tell you things that you already know. You want to respect them. You want them to feel safe and curious and not threatened and, and besieged. Um, you don't want them to feel like outsiders. Um, you don't want to break their hearts by telling them that they either believe what you're saying is true or they believe what their parents are saying is true. You don't want to put them in that spot. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe you teach, you know, it's, I know people, when people say, well, I teach the controversy, the controversy between creationism and, um, and evolutionary biology, well, that's really the controversy between science and the rejection of science, right. um, in my view. I know that Catholics, many Catholics, including several popes, um, have said the Catholic Church has no quarrel with evolutionary biology. I don't agree with that. I think that when push comes to shove, um, you can either believe in miracles or you can believe in science. Thank you. And basic as that. Um, but I don't know how to say that to a 14 year old in a, in a way that will, will empower and inspire that 14 year old rather than threatening that 14 year old. That's why you guys are, are the ones to do what you're doing because you, you, you have experience to do that. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Who else? I kind of have a follow-up on that question. 
Um, I feel I took a class in college about it was like a historical reading of Darwin and kind of like a how did he change intellectual history as opposed to like the science of evolution. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very challenging course um, and trying to pull out like what philosophically, not scientifically, was he pushing against. Um, and the right answer ended up being determinism. Um, and how, you know, evolution, it's kind of, you know, it's not towards this. I saw someone in the chat, you know, towards like a, a more perfect future. It's mm -hmm. like the cockroach is the one that's going to survive radiation because the cockroach for some reason is, is immune to that. Um, but so people, say that we... <laughs> people say that, but you always want to ask them which cockroach. There's a great biological diversity among cockroaches and not all of them are as adaptable as the German, quote unquote, German cockroach. Anyway, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, right. But it's, you know, it's kind of hopeless seeming. So how do we sort of like reinvigorate how, I don't know, some, I can see how that could be crushing for some students to sort of see how their, their maybe it wasn't a miracle or I don't know. How do you word that? Because I feel you know, like one of the, I, I think that, um, I mean, I, I realized I tried to do some of this myself in my little biography of Darwin, the reluctant Mr. Darwin. And um, one of the things I do in that book is present Darwin as this guy, a real guy, a, a, a man who came from a religious background himself, who was expected to become an Anglican minister, who did not become an Anglican minister, who was a fundamentally conservative man, a culturally conservative man, um, and, in, and to some degree an intellectually conservative man who, because he was extraordinarily um, perceptive and extraordinarily honest, found himself burdened with a really radical idea. Conservative man, radical idea. What do I do? This is going to break my wife's heart. The number one creationist in Charles Darwin's life was his wife, Emma. She's going to think that I am um, a barbarian, an atheist, um, a heathen um, destined for hell. How do I deal with this? And this happened at a very early stage in Darwin's life, uh, essentially when um, when he proposed to Emma, his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood, and they started talking about this. And I discussed this in my little biography and there's, um, and, and, and they talk it out right at the beginning and she writes, and then he goes, they live in just different towns and she goes, he goes back to London where he's living. She writes him a letter, a heartbreaking letter saying that, um, I know that what you believe is very, very different from what my faith seems to require me to believe. But I also believe that anything that you do that's honest um, and that's um, anything that you believe that's truly honest and derives from your own uh, acquired evidence and thinking cannot be totally error, cannot be sin. She writes this to him and essentially establishes this protocol that lasts through their marriage where uh, she doesn't believe what he believes, but she respects him and he respects her. He's sensitive to her feelings. And, um, and, but he's honest and determined and he plows ahead over the years and over the decades and publishes this book that is going to, um, upset her, challenge her beliefs ultimately, challenge the beliefs of most of the teachers that he had at Cambridge, John Stevens Henslow and Adam uh, Sedgwick, these great science teachers that he had who were also Anglican ministers themselves. And he goes ahead and, and he does it, but he always does it with respect and concern for the people that he knows that he's upsetting. And that's why the title of my book is The Reluctant Mr. Darwin. Um, so, so respect and sensitivity, but plow ahead honesty, a combination of those two things, I think, are what, um, what made Darwin a great 
biology teacher. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question slash follow up. Like, it seems like this is great. It's a great um, conversation for sort of our day and age, you know, with, um, uh, you know, f the sort of fake news you know, reality of, yeah. of people or, you know, finding their own information. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's been a, like, that's, it, it, I've always sort of faced that a little bit. I, I've been teaching climate change, um, you know, for about 20 years. Yeah. And uh, it's really like that alone has changed as a topic in just the 20 years that I've been um, teaching it yeah. as far as like believability and, and now it's part of the NGSS, thankfully. But um you know, one thing I've noticed, especially as you're talking about, you know, how we approach um, our our audiences is, is I've discovered that like the pointing of the finger, um, like you should think this or you shouldn't think that has been like, um, especially in environmental science and anything related to that, like that, that, that immediately puts up a wall, like your, your learning just completely stops. And so it is tricky to dance around, you know, and, and present facts or present um, data or evidence. Um, and I feel like that's been a real important shift in my own teaching, but also, um, but I also look at our current, you know, world view of science and just, God, it, after 20 years of teaching, it feels like a little bit of a failure to have this, you know, this, um, populace that's just kind of anti-science and um, anyway I just kind of wanted to throw that out yeah, there yeah yeah it's I, I agree with you it's very disheartening the anti-science the, um, the, the not just the continuation but the the rise the resurgence of anti-science sentiment and and there's a lot of it out there with in connection with COVID-19 too I mean people are inventing their own stories uh, about this as we sit here um, and they're going viral, those stories. Um, and, uh, and they have bias um, and they don't have, they don't have evidence. I wonder whether um, one of the ways forward for you as well as for me is, um, you know, if you talk about the data first, whatever the data is, oh look, here are some birds living on islands and they have different shaped beaks. Isn't that interesting? Look at how many different kinds of birds they are. Look at this one, uses a cactus spine to get insects as though it were a woodpecker. That's cool. Look at this one, it has a big robust beak. And oh, by the way, it eats seeds off the ground. And so these birds are not competing against one another, but they live on the same island. Isn't that interesting? Before you say, you know, there is a theory called evolution and you have to believe it. Maybe working inductively from, um, from the data, whatever the data are. Oh, look, another polar bear drowning. There have been, um, you know, seven polar bear drownings uh, noted in the, in the um, which, what is it, the Barents Sea? Um, wh why are polar bears drowning? Polar bears are aquatic. What's the deal? Let's learn about polar bears. Why the hell are they drowning? Maybe that's one way to concentrate on, on the data and move gently toward the explanatory theories um, rather than announcing uh, the theory as, as dogma. You know, we know that there is no, I suppose there is no scientific dogma except perhaps the idea that we all embrace if we believe in science, that, um, that the, the universe is, um, uh, reflects fixed laws, certain fixed laws that operate. Um, but we're not always 100% sure that we have learned that law accurately. And that's what science is all about. At least that's how I see it. Anybody else jump in on this? Uh, I'd like to know what other people think about it. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yeah, Jack. Okay. For, for the new um, teacher, it's... Um, they have to begin with nature and science and making sure they know exactly what it is and what it is not. And a, a job like David's storytelling, 
that is one of the absolute best ways to go about teaching any topic, but it requires a lot of the teaching. So you have to really know your material and you always provide links to the actual articles, to the research. So if you're going to, I love telling the story of vestigial structures and evolution. I think it tells a story about as good as anything you can. But I want them to actually see an ice fish and learn how hemoglobin got lost and how that into so many things. It takes a, a great deal of effort, but if you can find the great stories, the ones that you want to tell, that you think you can tell the best and, and pull it all in together, it's like, like writing a wonderful book and telling Darwin's story or Great way to approach it with the facts. Everything else will fall in line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, maybe if that uh, biology teacher I'd had in college had, had had a story to tell about algae taxonomy, it uh, would have been more interesting. I mean, um, you know, there's, I, there's a, I'm sure there's a scientist. I'm sure I'm sure there's a great scientist who has studied algae taxonomy and um, and maybe his story or her story would be a way to get interested in algae. I actually know such a scientist <laughs> uh, here in Louisiana. There's a, there's a, a biologist that I, I've been working with with my students. Her name is Dr. Beth Stauffer, uh, and she's been studying how the recent floods and hurricanes have been affecting algae populations in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, changing when the blooms are happening, how large they are, stuff like that. So then, <laughs> you've already got my attention, Blake, in a way that this guy never did. Yeah, but I mean that's something that all of all of my kids know about because it, it affects you know their their day to day life and when they're going to be able to go to school if there's a flood or, or a hurricane or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of their parents are in the the seafood industry, shrimpers or fishers or you know, and and that's. That's the food that those shrimp rely on. So they know if there's a bad algae bloom this year, then shrimp population is not going to be there. So, Yeah, yeah. Okay, good point. Storytelling. Okay. Um, what else from anybody? I just got a message saying that Andy loves stromatolites. Where's Andy? And who knows about stromatolites? There's Andy. Stromatolites, remind me, Andy. Uh, well, I just actually uh, got a chance a couple of summers ago. I was up in Copper Harbor, Michigan uh, with my wife's family um, and found some stromatolites. And uh, I don't know, just I, it, I love anything that's really ancient. Um, and that was probably with the most ancient fossils I've found so far. And I don't know, it just kind of blew me away. This little tiny rock that I have, and it's, it represents, you know, the, the oxygenation of our, of our planet and allows us to actually exist. And um, so that little piece of the, of Earth's story for me was really fun. And so I love having this rock on my desk and saying, hey, yeah, yeah, you know, there's a stromatolites right there. So. So a stromatolite, remind me, is a fossil bacterial colony? Well, they're, they're, they are still alive today in certain places, but it's a it's cyanobacteria, and they basically create these um, formations of sediment um, as the sediment washes over them, and these colonial mats of cyanobacteria just for billions of years quietly pumping out oxygen um, and taking in CO2. So. Mm -hmm. um, but they were major players during the KT boundary event. Yeah. Sorry. But there's, they're kind of like algae. <laughs> mm -hmm. Often called yeah. blue-green algae. Oh, right. Cyanobacteria used to be class. That, that's what used to be blue-green algae, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, that teacher did teach you something. He didn't teach me that. <laughs> that's from researching the tangled tree. Ford Doolittle worked a lot on cyanobacteria. Um, so I learned, uh, don't, you know, uh, don't call it blue-green algae anymore. Um, I'm just writing something today. Um, 
the Tangled Tree is being published in Italy, and uh, they the and the the publisher there is is really good, and I have a good relationship with them. The spillover right now is is a very successful book in Italy. Um, it's sad sad to say that it has taken this kind of a thing, but the, the book is, you know, very conspicuous, and I'm spending a lot of time talking to um, Italian media. But, and so they're publishing a tangled tree, and I've been. They asked me to write a thousand words or eighteen hundred words, explaining the journey of of creating uh, that book, the tangled tree, um, which involves this fellow Ford Doolittle and Carl Woese and um, and disc and horizontal gene transfer, and uh, me getting interested in what horizontal gene transfer. That was in spring of two thousand thirteen when I was looking for my next book project and. And I read something about horizontal gene transfer. It might have been in a column by one of my colleagues, uh, Ed Young or, or Carl Zimmer. I'm not sure what was. And, and I got very interested in horizontal gene transfer because I thought that we knew that that was impossible. And then suddenly these people were telling me, no, it's impossible. It is possible when it happens. And it's very consequential. Um, and, uh, and pretty soon I was reading Fort Doolittle on the subject of cyanobacteria. And, um, and him um, as a youngish researcher taking Lynn Margulis's idea about endosymbiosis that she had developed on microscopical evidence and testing it with this new kind of technique that his friend Carl Woese had developed in Urbana, Illinois, which was to sequence fragments of genomes and then build trees of life and then discover that, whoa, this patch of genomic material over on this limb came from that limb over there. How did it get over here? Verifying the, uh, uh, the reality of horizontal gene transfer. David, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about interacting with the folks in Italy. Have you been at, with this like 24 hour news cycle going on with coronavirus? Have, have any of the networks in the US contacted you to be one of the, one of the talking heads? Yes, yeah, I've been a talking head almost nonstop for the last nine weeks with one outfit or another. Um, NPR, a little bit of CNN, um, a lot of media in Italy, uh, media in Brazil, media in South Korea. Um, so I'm one of the people that uh, has been flapping his jaw uh, a lot on, on this subject. And now finally I'm getting some time to do new um, new research, new thinking about it, new writing about it myself. But I've gotten very, very tired of hearing my own voice uh, answering the same questions about um, spillover of zoonotic diseases and coronaviruses and where this one came from and, and whether it came from a lab accident. No, it didn't come from a lab accident. Whether it came from a biodefense um, nefarious intentional release. No, no, it's not an engineered virus, it's a real virus that, um, that comes from bats, possibly by way of an amplifier animal. Anyway, yeah, uh, Alan, I've been much involved in that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, David, I have a question Hello. for you. First of all, keep talking, thank you. <laughs> get it, get <laughs> the information out, I love okay. it. <laughs> by now, the way, this morning at, at five, 40 a.m. I was talking to a committee of the South African Parliament. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then at, uh, a little after that, um, a television station in Italy, and um, I can't remember what else. Anyway, go ahead, Colleen. Yeah, so my question is, um, going back to evolution, so many kids have this misconception that it's a linear or ladder-like event. And I'm just one, I haven't read your Tangled Tree yet. Um, and maybe the, I'll find answers in there, but I'm just curious if you have some favorite imagery or something that might help students to understand it better, you know? That to it's to understand evolution? Yes, uh-huh, like some. Yeah, well, I would, uh, not, with all due respect to Jonathan Eisen, I would not start with molecular phylogenetics. Um, I would start with, well, and he doesn't exactly, he starts with phylogenetics, he starts with the tree of life. Um, but, uh, well, let's see. Uh, I mean, there, 
there are lots of examples and, and um, many of them are fresher than the story of Darwin's finches. Of course, the mockingbirds were more important to Darwin than the finches were at the time anyway. Um, how to teach evolution. You know what, I think, um, I think the best entry to, to evolution for students is biogeography. Start with biogeography. Just start with the wondrous fact that the world is filled with fascinating creatures that live in very particular places and they don't live in other places. And oh, isn't that curious? Iguanas live in, um, where do iguanas live? In, um, in Africa and South America, no, iguanas live in, I forget the distribution of iguanas. Can it be um, Madagascar, but not Africa, and then again in South America? They're in Central America too. In Central America, okay. Um, marsupials live in Australia and South America, and oh, then some of them get up into North America in the form of our, what we call the Virginia possum. Um, um, hummingbirds live in Africa. Um, no, Sun, sunbirds live in Africa with long bills and hovering over flowers, drinking, um, drinking nectar. And instead of sunbirds in the Americas, we have hummingbirds. Um, toucans live in South America with these big bills that serve great purposes, cracking open fruit. And there are no toucans in Asia but there are hornbills doing the same thing. What's that about? I, I would start with all of these magnificent facts of anomalous, dis seemingly anomalous distribution. These creatures live here, but not there. These creatures are related to those creatures and very similar. Um, what is that about? And of course, the explanation for all of those patterns is, um, uh, essentially vicariant biogeography. It's, um, it's evolution in situ plus the movement of um, land masses and the movement of some kinds of animals that achieve distribution. So, uh, you know, biogeography, I mean, this was the principle that I used going into writing a 600 page book that took me eight years called The Song of the Dodo. The principle was, gee, biogeography is really entertaining, but then it leads to this deep understanding of evolution. So that's my suggestion. So does that mean you're more of a I don't Wallace? remember the particulars well enough. I used to be able to just rattle off these uh, sunbirds here and iguanas there and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I haven't reread that book in 15, 20, 22 years, whatever. So I'm, I'm uh, a little bit shaky on those details. So does that mean you're more of a Wallace fan than a Darwin? No, uh, although Wallace is the hero of the Song of the Dodo, Wallace is not the hero of the reluctant Mr. Darwin. So I've written two books at least, and, and have talked about it in other places, but I've written two books that, that include an examination of the Darwin-Wallace controversy, the Darwin-Wallace interaction. And in the first of those, I'm sympathetic, particularly toward Wallace, and in the second, I'm sympathetic particularly toward Darwin. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's an event of prismatic complexity and depending on which way you turn it, the light comes out of it in a different color. Um, I love it. It's a fascinating story. Uh, I love Wallace, but I don't love Wallace to the exclusion of Darwin or to the demonization of Darwin. And I don't love Darwin to the, to the marginalization of Wallace. Wallace was a great biogeographer, greatest field biologist of the 19th century, for my money. But Wallace was wrong about things. He was cranky about things. Wallace was an anti-vaxxer. Um, Wallace did not believe in the evolution of um, the human brain. He believed in spiritualism. He believed in seances. He was a complicated guy, which of course makes him a great character. storytelling. I realized that telling the story of some obscure field called island biogeography and what that had to do with 
the understanding of evolution and extinction on planet Earth, telling the story of island biogeography, what's the best way to do that? Well, I wrote a long opening section called The Man Who Knew Islands. And who was the man? The man was Wallace. And for storytelling, one of the things, um, and I'm blanking on the author's name, but he wrote the book uh, a couple of years ago, Darwin's Armada. And it was the story of these great voices of early evolutionary thought. And one of the things they all have in common is they all took great voyages across the Southern Hemisphere visiting islands. Yes. Archipelagos. You're right. And that's right. a great story to tie that all together as well. Right. right. Ian Wallace. McCallum. McCallum? Yeah. I don't think I don't think I have read that book. It sounds familiar, but I, I think it's um it's a gap in my my knowledge of Darwiniana. Uh, but yeah, so great voyages to see the world, right? That's what opened their eyes. Darwin, Beagle, Wallace, uh, four years in South America and then eight years in the Malay archipelago. Um, Huxley on board the Rattlesnake, Her Majesty's ship, the Rattlesnake, as a, as a lowly ship's surgeon. Um, Hooker went to India. Um, um, she wasn't an evolutionary biologist, but boy, Mary Kingsley. Do you all know Mary Kingsley? Mary Kingsley is a great story. She was a Victorian um, uh, woman from a family that had um, very little money. And her father was a retired military guy. And she found herself stuck because of sort of gender expectations, stuck taking care of her, her dying father and her near-do-well brother. It was just the three of them living in a little flat in London. And she was working essentially as a slave to these two guys. And then um, a, a stroke of very, very good luck to the world of people who love good reading. Her father and her husband died. They, they croaked and she was left with a little inheritance. And in a, an act of incredible heroism, she said, I'm going to take my little inheritance and I'm going to go to Africa and, and buy some, some beads and some brass bars and some calico cloth. And I'm going to go up the river, the Ogui River in what is now uh, Gabon. And I'm going to become a trader. I'm going to take my dresses, my long dresses, and I'm going to climb in and out of dugout canoes. And I'm going to hire guys to pull the canoe and to cook for me. And I'm just going to figure this out. And while I'm there, I'm going to collect fish. I'm going to pickle them in alcohol. And I'm going to bring them back to this guy at the British Museum who studies fish. And I have an agreement with him. He'll take all the pickled African fish that I can bring him. And he will do the ta taxonomy. He will describe and classify them. So she did that. And she wrote a couple of books about it. Uh, and to her great credit, she had a sense of humor, um, uh, an ineradicable sense of humor. She took pratfalls. She took risks. Um, she suffered. And rather than uh, writing a book like Joseph Conrad, The Heart of Darkness, that sort of melodramatized all that, she turned it into, she was the, um, uh, he, she was the Redmond O'Hanlon of the 19th century. She wrote books that were readable and funny and yet uh, very humane. Um, and uh, she had a good eye for the humanity and all the people that she met in the villages up and down the Agua River. So if you haven't read Mary Kingsley, I highly recommend it. John, you're the moderator here. You tell us, uh, maybe, I don't know if Sarah had an, another question or Alan or somebody had anything, but um, you be the one to say, okay, we should let people go whenever that's appropriate. Well, I'll tell you that this group will uh, will ask you questions well after midnight, so we don't <laughs> want to um, get you too carried away. But let's take a couple more, and then I'm curious if you wouldn't mind when, to wrap up what, um, where you're headed from this. And what what your next uh, things are? But I know, okay. yes, yeah, Sarah. 
I think Sarah, you had the next question. So why don't we jump on to you there? Yeah, just, I just wanted to um, mention that, um, you know, as we teach, I, I don't know if I think most of us are teaching high schoolers or some of us are, you know, I taught, um, I, I teach mostly seniors, juniors and seniors that are about to just go off into the world. And one of the things that I brought up with the island bi biogeography this year was just the age of Darwin when he went on his exploration. And you just mentioned all these other explorers and Mary Kingsley's a great example. I've never heard of her, but now I can bring that in um, just to connect with kids that are, don't see themselves as scientists, but just, and don't know what to do. And so, you know, that sort of that, that leap into the unknown and where our um, adventures can take us and what that can lead to. I think that's a really um, powerful, story for us to bring into the science you that know so I, I really appreciate you bringing up those other explorers it's awesome well, well good that that does make sense and it you know in particular darwin you know when he when he went off on the beagle he was a confused young guy who did not know what he was going to do with his life yeah. yeah um and that is just that's a great starting point to to allow kids to connect with somebody and he wasn't that much older than a lot of my kids right. that were that don't have any idea what they want to do with right. their lives. So yeah, he had gone at the age of sixteen. He'd gone to medical school in uh, Edinburgh, and he hated it. And he was a dropout. He went home, and his father was a doctor, and his brother was a doctor, and now he's a dropout. Charles Darwin is a is a dropout failure at the age of eighteen. Okay, then you better go to Cambridge and train to be a clergyman. Otherwise, what the hell are we going to do with you? All right, I'll go to Cambridge and train to be a clergyman. Oh, but I'm also taking geology. That's pretty interesting. And I love to collect beetles. That's pretty interesting. He was a young guy who just didn't know what his path through the world was going to be. He was taking it one step at a time. But he was, um, he was confused and he was uncertain, but he was always courageous and honest. Maybe else? one last uh, one last shot. All right. Well, David, I know this has been a, a crazy uh, time for you, as it has been for all of us. So, where where do you go next? Where do I go? Uh, Wuhan, China. But I don't know when. I don't know when. I'm not going to go uh, when it's unreasonable. You know, I love life and, and my wife doesn't want me to go too soon. But, um, and I was working on a book for Simon and Schuster about cancer and evolution, cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon. It's been something that I've wanted to write a book about for about 15 years since I did a, a magazine story in Harper's um, on the subject of, of cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon and the fact that there is such a thing as contagious cancer and the Tasmanian devil and it's, one end of the spectrum of, of the ways that populations of, um, of rogue cells can evolve. And about uh, three weeks ago, Simon and Schuster said to me, David, would you please push that cancer and evolution book to the back of your desk and write a book about COVID-19? And my immediate reaction was, I don't wanna write, I have always wanted, not to write books about things that other people were writing books about. My operating principle is write, a, write about something that, that nobody else thinks is important yet and try and make it important or that nobody else thinks is interesting yet and try and make it interesting. Um, but, um, and I know that there are as many publishing houses as there are in New York, there's gonna be that many COVID-19 books. And I don't wanna be in a race, I don't wanna, rush to publish the first one. We're inundated with information about COVID-19 anyway, right now. New York Times, wall-to-wall -wall COVID-19, NPR is full of COVID-19, whatever we're reading, you know, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, uh, Scientific American, filled with COVID-19. Uh, so how do you write a book about it? I don't know. It's not going to be easy. Um, but The Tangled Tree wasn't easy either. Um, none of these books have been easy that, for me. It's always sort of a steep learning curve and a challenge. So this is a slightly different challenge. This time, write a book about something that everybody is paying attention to. But try and write a COVID-19 book that's different 
from the others and valuable in its own unique ways. How do you do that? For me, you start not with the medical emergency in New York. That's a book for Sherry Fink to write or somebody else. You start with the science. You start with, um, you start with a, a virus and a bat and maybe a pangolin. Um, and you tell stories of science that also um, will have a room, room for stories of human suffering and human heroism and things that are closer to home for people. Uh, so, um, so when it comes to where, do, uh, figuratively, where do I go next? I go into that project. Literally, where, I, where do I go next? I go around the block with our dogs. Uh, I'm not doing much travel beyond that right now. But when it becomes reasonable to get on an airplane, if I can get in to China, I will go to Wuhan. Um, and I hope uh, talk with people at the Wuhan Institute of Virology who did this work. Um, you know, I climbed through bat caves in China um, looking for dangerous viruses already when I was researching spillover. If I get the opportunity to do that again, I will. Um, um, if I can't get into China, then I'll probably start with um, Singapore and uh, South Korea uh, because they both were touched by this early on and yet they managed to respond to it in ways that were um, much more um, effective and intelligent than the way we have in the US. So that's the answer to your question, John. Well, that, that is wonderful to hear and for all of us to keep an eye open for over the coming months and, um, and years. And I can't thank you enough for taking time out of what I know for you is a crazy, crazy time to uh, speak with those of us here who are facing our own struggles of being away from our students and trying to figure things out ourselves. And this is a wonderful, wonderful break for us to be able to share with someone of your stature and your generosity. And I can't thank you enough for your well, time this afternoon. You're, you're very welcome. And I bounce it back to you. There's no, there's no group that I'd rather be talking to right now. Um, and uh, I have huge, you know this already, John, but I have huge respect for what you all do. It is just absolutely crucial. Among other things, it's crucial in turning around the, the know-nothing anti-science sentiment in this country. There's nobody that's gonna be more important in that than high school biology teachers. So thank you, thank you well, all. Thank you and, and thank all of you who are here um, for spending your time with us. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled that we had such a group here. So um, feel free to unmute and a standing ovation for you. <laughs> We really appreciated it, David. You're very welcome. It's been, it's yes, been thank fun. you so much. You're very welcome. Fun talking with you all. Good luck. Good luck and Godspeed. Um, uh, although I'm not a Catholic anymore, so that when I say Godspeed, it's with a small G as opposed to a capital G. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yep. Well, many, many thanks and have a great time, everybody.